our greatest mistake is that we put a lot of things before God. God doesn't put anything before us. We are his object of his love and desire. But we, we will put work, we will put this, we will put that, we will put, we, we have so many excuses why we don't spend time with God. But there is no Bible study, there is no prayer, there is no fasting that can take the place of being in his presence. Understanding how, because when you get to his presence, when you bring your flesh to his presence and your spirit connect with his spirit, things begin to happen in the supernatural. The desires of your flesh begin to come under control. Sicknesses, when the light of his glory comes near you, sicknesses just disappear. And that is why when we come into an atmosphere of heaven, things happen naturally. All you need to do is to get into the presence of God. The psalmist says, as the deer pants after the water brooks, so my heart pants after you. Because the deer knows that if I can get into the water, the enemy loses the scent. The animal are chasing the deer to kill it. It can't, it can't find the scent again. The hounds, they can't find, the hounds of hell, they can't find the scent again. All I need to, let, just let me get into his presence. Just let me get there. Whatever is chasing me, just let me get there first. I know I find safety. I know I find refuge. I know I find direction. I know my victory is certain. And the greatest strategy of the devil is to do everything to make sure that is the last thing we do that we do so many other things first. <laughs> Praise God. In Psalm 53 and verse 2, the Bible says, God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. God is looking for who has the same heart, who wants to seek me like I am seeking them. It was the love and God seeking us that made Christ to come. And look at the price he paid because he was seeking us. On the cross, the crucifixion of his flesh. You know, sometimes we don't... Um, <laughs> a few days ago, uh, I, was, I, was, I was gardening, okay? I was gardening, I was using a shovel, and then part of that shovel... <laughs> hit my toe. Thank God there was no cut. But come on. <laughs> I understood pain at another level. And God said, you know, and that, that it, the spirit just ministered to me quickly. I said, look at you. It didn't even cut you. But, but look at how you are feeling. Now imagine someone that they take an axe and they cut his hand. Imagine this person that they put a knife through and stab. What is now your own? You just scrape it and you know, and you, you, are, you are doing like this. And so, imagine the desperation of God to go through what He went through on the cross in order to reach you. Compare that with your desperation for God and my desperation for God because I can't tell you that I'm, I'm, I'm fully desperate as I should be. I'm trying. I'm doing my best. Amen. But I want to do more. I am hungry for more. Amen. I'm hungry for more. Well, that is God's desire. That is God's only desire. He said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, says, all other things, all the other things, every other thing you think is important now, they are really not, they are secondary things, they are not primary things. They are not primary things. You know, the primary thing is your life. No matter how much you gather, no matter how much you walk, no matter whatever you do, if you die now, pim, that's it, that's all. If somebody else will take over. <laughs> somebody, it becomes somebody else's property. And if you don't make a proper will, it may not even go to your children. The government will take almost half of it. So what I'm saying is this. 
if you understand that you are precious. Look at what the Bible says in Zechariah. In Zechariah, I think it's chapter 2 and verse 8, and God was speaking concerning Israel, and we are the spiritual Israelites today, and says, he who touches you, touches the apple of my eye. Now, now I want you to understand who you are in God. God says you are like what? Do, do you know what the, he says? You are like the apple of my eye. God says you are like the apple. He says whoever is trying to touch you is trying to touch the apple of my How important is your eye to you? Because that's how to reason the scriptures. How important is your eye to you? Your eye perhaps is one of the most precious things. That if anything is coming to you, that's the first thing you. <laughs> God says you are like the apple of my eye. You are, that is how precious you are to God. And if we don't understand how precious we are to God, the tendency is for us to abuse life. We don't appreciate what God has given to us as life because we don't appreciate how in the eyes of God we are precious to God. We can come and worship God because we have already in our mind God is great, God is mighty. Oh, God can do all things. But as we are worshiping the greatness of God, we lose sight of who we are. Because we think, you know, you know I, I, I am nothing. I, but God does not see you as nothing. If God saw you as nothing, he would not have come to die for you. And so without an understanding of how God sees you, you cannot maximize your life. You will live below, you will sell yourself short. And any time we don't, <laughs> we don't pursue his presence, we are selling ourselves short. Because only in his presence can we truly see who we are. He says, as we behold him, it's only he that when we behold, we are transformed. There is a, a spiritual reckoning. There is a spiritual, there is a, there is a heart to heart resuscitation. There is a mouth to mouth resuscitation when you are in the presence of God. Hallelujah. There is a spirit to spirit impartation. And then you begin to become like what you see. As you see him, you become what you see. It becomes possible to live what you see. It becomes possible to become what you believe. One of the big questions we ask ourselves is, is it really possible to know God? <laughs> you know, that scripture you quoted on the Friday from uh, John chapter 17, verse 3. The Bible says, and this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is that we might know him. Eternal life is present, it's now. It's not in heaven. Amen. It's now. Eternal life starts now. People say, okay, ah, he has died and gone to heaven. No, 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 no. God didn't create us to die to go to heaven. Actually, Christ came to earth so that we can enter heaven now. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? So some people say, okay, well, we're going to see, you know, I just want to make, I, I want to make heaven. No, you have access to heaven now. Amen. Because eternal life starts now. The new creation, the new spirit that God enabled Christ to impart to us, we have become new creations. Amen. Amen. That new Christian life starts now. It's not when you die. Is it, is it a difficult concept to understand? <laughs> eternal life is now. And so that eternal life that is in you now, if you don't start to know Jesus, you can't fulfill his purpose for you here. Because Christians don't die. Christians just sleep. Because the spirit is already alive. The spirit cannot die. <laughs> Spirits don't die. 
Have you had one day they said, okay, yeah, and they want to bury that spirit that died. Spirits don't die. The body dies, the body decays. The mind also doesn't die. The mind. So when we get to heaven, I will know this is Bob God. This is Bob God. I know you. I know you. This is better. This is, I will know you. you will, there will be recognition. Amen. The spirit and the soul never dies. It is the body that perishes. It made you from the dust. What God put there never dies. The body will die. The body is just a vehicle. Praise God. And you can change your vehicle anytime. And so transition is just changing the vehicle. But the spirit never dies. The spirit is eternal as God. And he said, this is eternal life. That eternal life is to, you will spend eternity knowing him. So better start now. Praise God. Is it possible to really know God? Isaiah 43 verse 10. God was telling them in that time in the Old Testament. He said, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. You are my servant. I chose you for one thing, to know me and understand me. To know me and understand me. That's the purpose of everything, to know him and understand him. If you know him and understand, say those who do know their God, they shall be strong and they shall be, do exploits. Daniel 11.32 says, the eyes of the Lord they run to and fro to show himself strong and mighty on behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him. It's not that they, are, they don't have any fault. It's just that their heart is continuously seeking him. David was a man after God's heart because every day of his life, his heart was panting after God. And that should be the kind of example and the life that we live. And so my second question is, is it really possible to know God? Look at Hebrews chapter 11. And in verse 5, the Bible talks to us about a man called Enoch. A man who does not have the benefit of the covenant we have now. Because the covenant we have now we have been justified. We have been washed. We have been cleansed. We have been justified. We have been sanctified. We have been made holy by the death of Jesus Christ, by the blood that was shed to stand in the presence of God. But before that time, before Christ came, there was a man called Enoch. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, he knew God by faith. <laughs> Amen. He knew God by faith. He wasn't redeemed as we are redeemed. And so we don't have an excuse not to pursue knowing God as much as we can know him. He says, by faith Enoch was taken up so that he did not see death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. I'm going to ask you three questions I want you to write down. What does it mean to know God? What does it take to know God? What do we need to know about God? Hallelujah. What does it take? What does it mean? What does it mean? I read from uh, Charles Spurgeon. I know it's Liz who loves Charles Spurgeon in this church. <laughs> uh, praise God. Now, now you know, the word in Hebrew, yada, 
which is knowledge, means to perceive and understand, to believe. Uh, the three questions, okay. It's what does it mean to know God? What does it take to know God? What do we need to know about God? Hallelujah. Paul was trying to answer these questions in Philippians chapter 3. When he cried out in prayer that I may know him. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. And you find that there are very different ways of knowing. I can recognize, knowing can be in the form of recognition that I know, ah, uh, this is Bob Guy, it's not an ED. <laughs> so I can know the difference, I can distinguish, <laughs> praise God. When I hear Bob Gar singing, I know this is Pastor Bob Gar singing. When I hear Nidi singing, I know ah, this is, you know, the Kina Nidi. Amen. In a way, I can say, well, I know, I know, I know Bob Gar, but that's different. Amen. It can't be the kind of knowledge as Dickness Musha will say, you know, I know Bob Gar. It's different. Are you getting what I'm saying? Now, okay, as can also know someone through casual conversation. In other words, when I go to the gym, the person that attends to me, you know, there's a lady I'm very fond of in the gym, and when I get there in the morning and I say, hello, and she says, hello, good morning, it's going to be a great day today, yeah. I can claim to know that person at the reception because she recognizes me when I come in and I recognize her. But do I really know her? Come on. No, I don't. Amen. Don't know the name of her husband. I don't know her children. There's also a realm of knowledge whereby, you know, like uh, I come into Bob Gar's house or I need his house, and we sit down and we just chat and we talk. Praise God. And that's another dimension. But knowing Jesus includes all this and more. And I'll tell you the more. Because in Philippians chapter 3 verse 10, Paul began to hunger for that more that is beyond recognition, that is beyond association, that is beyond also the kind of communion of marriage. And so in Philippians chapter 3, it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And so he was talking about something deeper. It is not just knowing Jesus historically, knowing the Jesus written about in the Bible, and being able to say that, yes, I know the story, Jesus, he turned water to wine. Yes, I know the story, Jesus, in Matthew chapter this, and Jesus in Luke chapter this, and Jesus in, <laughs> in John chapter this, 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 and this. You can know the history. You can know the history. You can even teach the history of it and teach the theology of it. But Paul was saying, I want to know not the Jesus who lived in history. I want to know not just the Jesus who went to the cross and died for me. I want to know him beyond history. I want to know him beyond the cross. I want to understand the resurrected power. I want to, I want to understand him in the realm of where he is now in glory and power. He says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know because Paul understood that when we are born again, when we receive Christ Jesus, and he, told, he expressed that prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, he 
he knew and understood that certain realms have opened to us. And what we need is a paradigm shift in our mind for us not to think like human beings, not to see the impossibilities and the challenges and of the physical flesh because, because we are embodied in flesh, we see the limitations. I need to get into a car to get to Newcastle. I cannot just close my eyes now and appear in Newcastle. There's the limitations of my flesh. Now, the limitations of my flesh and the, the natural limitations of life, there is gravity. I can't climb a ladder here now and jump down and not feel an impact, either in my leg or in my hip or something. So there are limitations of my flesh, but we transfer that limitation that we feel in the physical universe, we transfer it into our mind to affect our spirit. But Jesus walked in a way that he did not, he did not allow those limitations. And so he could speak to the wind. He could speak to the tree. He could walk on water. And Paul was saying, you know what? That power, when he resurrected, was transferred to me. I want to know that. I want to know that. I'm not satisfied with just knowing the history. I'm not satisfied with just knowing the significance. I want to know the power. Of the respect. I want to live. I want to walk in that dimension. I want, I want to change the paradigm of my mind. I want to change how I think about the physical things. I want to see the way Jesus sees it in order for me to engage the power that he engaged with. Charles Spurgeon says this. And when I found this, I rejoiced because it just follows what we have been doing for the whole month. Charles Spurgeon says, they tell me he's a refiner that he cleanses from spots. He has washed me in his precious blood. And to that extent, I know him. They tell me that he clothes the naked. He has covered me with a garment of righteousness and to that extent I know him they tell me he's a breaker and that he breaks fetters he has set my soul at liberty and therefore to that extent I know him <laughs> they tell me that he's a king and that he reigns over sin he has subdued my enemies beneath his feet and I know him in that character. They tell me he's a shepherd. And I know him for I'm his sheep. They say he's a door. I have entered in through him. And I know him as a door. They say he's food. My spirit feeds on him as on the bread of heaven. And therefore I know him as such. Hallelujah. You know, it is possible to know him as Savior and not know him as healer. <laughs> it is possible to know him as my Redeemer and not even know him as Deliverer. You know. But when you embrace the power of his resurrection, the I am that I am is everything you can ever need. I am. You feel it. I am. Feel whatever you want at the end. He becomes it. Hallelujah. You will know him. Why don't we know him as we should? We choose other things. We, cho we make wrong choices. We choose other things. That is the one and only reason. You know, the only thing... Paul said, count everything else as dung. Count my achievements, count my degrees, count my honor. Let everything be as dung compared to the knowledge of him. 
because he recognized the value. You know, whatever we don't have value for, we never draw virtue from. It is commensurate. The kind of value you have for something de determines what you can receive from it. If you don't have value for it, you can't draw virtue from it. And so Paul, as far as Paul was concerned, you know, nothing else matters like knowing him. And that's the truth. If that becomes a priority in our lives, you know, I was um, sharing in Leicester a couple of weeks ago, and I said the first principle when it comes to marriage sometimes is that find a place to serve. Because when you look at Genesis, God gave man first work. He gave man work. And then he made him to sleep. And then brought his wife to him. <laughs> Praise God. And then so find work. Find work in the house of God. Find something to do. Find work. Because, you know, the core of your destiny is where you are serving God, where you are working God. Every other thing is irrelevant. I'm telling you, the job you are doing is just to earn money to feed your body. You know, if you can find where God wants you to worship, and you can find what God wants you to do to serve him, let everything else revolve around it. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know people in the U.S. who have had to move, move across country because God said, that is the church. Go on, that's where I, I planted you. <laughs> they made sacrifices and they have never regretted it. That is the core thing. God, where do you want me to serve you and what do you want me to do? And then sleep. <laughs> do what? Sleep. Just walk and relax. Not that one sister comes and says, ah, maybe it's this sister. Oh, ah, look at this sister. It's just my type. <laughs> Focus on your work. Focus on what? Focus on your work. Find a place to serve. Keep serving God. And God will perfect all that concerns you. Say, seek ye for all of that, they will be added they'll be added. The blessings that make rich, what will not add sorrow, what will not cause you headache, what will not bring you problem, it will be added naturally without struggle. Amen. Only God can touch our hearts and make our plans work in a way that the decadence, the corruption, the sorrows of this world, the evil of this world has no part in our life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so my, 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 the summary of my message today is please desire God. <laughs> Amen. Desire God. And the exercise we are doing is just, is, is like training. It's just training. It's, it's part of spiritual training. When I get you to wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning, even those who are in the world, if you go and read a lot of success books and all that and so on, say, you know, there's, there's something about waking up at 5 in the morning. I don't know why, but most most extremely successful people just wake up at five. <laughs> they start their day early. Amen. And so when we, it, it's part of training. Church is a place to train for life. Because life is a school where you never graduate. And the greatest mistake people make in life is they go, they get a degree, they get a job, and they feel, yes, that is it. I'm just grinding, just doing this job, just getting money, just feeding myself. I'm saving to buy my house. And... No, life is beyond your work. 
Life is a school you never graduate. Life is a school where you keep learning. You keep learning. You keep learning. You cannot fully learn about God. When we see him, we'll see him how he is. But the depth, and that is why God brings us together as a church, as a place of fellowship, as a place where we can learn from each other, where we can have peer-to-peer -peer review. Amen? Where he can lead, or lead, lead us in this kind of exercises. Because that's what I just call it. It's like a military exercise. 30 minutes in the morning, we, look, we start with Jesus. And when, when you start with Jesus, you keep Jesus in your focus throughout the day. There is no better way to live. And we end the night from 9 to 10 so that by the time you even are going to bed, you keep Jesus in your mind as you are sleeping. <laughs> Praise God. It's part of the training. And I pray that uh, we will catch it. David said, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek. One thing. He recognized that as far as God is concerned, God has one desire. God has one desire. God doesn't have many desires. God has one desire. And that one desire is you. God's desire is you. God's desire is that you may know him. God's desire is that you may trust him. Because you can't trust the person you don't know. If I don't know you, I can't trust you. Now, if I don't love you, I, can't, I may not sacrifice for you. And so when knowledge grows to become trust and trust develops into love, which is exactly what happened from the other side, God towards us, because he made us, he knows our frame, he knows that there was nothing in man that can make man to escape the mire where he got himself by obeying Satan and falling to the tricks of the enemy. He knew that there's nothing in man. There's nothing. There was no way man could get out of that problem. And so out of love, God came down and pulled us out and delivered us by himself. Praise God. It is love that brought him. It is that same love that he still is pursuing. He's still pursuing. He's still pursuing. He's still pursuing. And I think the greatest objective of life is like David to say, okay, Lord, I know there is one thing you desire. You desire me. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine that I am the object of God's love? Ooh! You know, Pastor Tina came, I think it was on Friday, and he said, I think God loves me more than everybody else. I said, you don't know what you are talking about. <laughs> but that is how each one of us should feel. When we look at our lives and we see the goodness of God and we see, we see our errors and we see our mistakes and we see how God still loves us in spite of ourselves, why won't you feel special? Why won't you think? You know, sometimes I, I look at myself and say, God, you know, right from when I was born like this, God has always favored me has always favored me in so profound ways that I say, God, how? What have I done? I've not even done anything. <laughs> and I tell my siblings sometimes, I say, it's the prayer of my mom. I say, ah, my mom prayed for me. Oh, hey. You know, my mom, my mom prayed. I'm telling you, if you are talking about a mother, my mother prayed. But I know it was God who gave me a praying mother. Amen. And so I want you to know that if you are God's desire, God should be your desire. God should be our desire. God should be, God should be our desire. And that's what distinguished David. He said, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple to inquire in his temple is that I desire not just to be in his presence I desire to know what he is thinking 
I desire to know, Lord, what are you thinking about this matter? Okay, um, this is what I'm planning. This is what looks good, but what are you thinking? I, I, you know, it's not so much about what I want to do, but will it please you when I do it? Is it in line with, you know, and that was David. He was always asking. He was always inquiring. He was always, he was passionate about being on God's side. No matter how good the prospect looks, no matter how challenging it was. You remember at Ziglag, it was so challenging. It was so difficult. The Bible said the men, they wept all night. But the Bible says David, he encouraged himself in the Lord. He said, you know, the Lord is my refuge. He's my strength. As long as he is on my side, nothing is lost. He said, Father, what do I do? And God, God, God spoke to him. In Psalm 3, we saw that as the glory and the lifter of my head a couple of days ago. And here was David. He had lost everything. He was running from Absalom, his son. Some of his leaders and people that he trained and he loved and he helped, they had turned against him. And he was chased out of his palace. But David said, I will not be afraid of 10,000 people <laughs> that rise up against me because what God, you are the glory, you are the lifter up of my head. I slept and I awoke because you sustained me. You sustained me to sleep that in the midst of this trouble, you still gave me sleep. I was able to sleep. And then you woke me up that you woke me up that I have life means there is hope. Means this battle is not lost. Means re full recovery is possible. And that was the spirit of David. He knew God. He sought God. He said in Psalm 27 verse 8, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, will I seek. In Psalm 62, he said, my, my soul waits silently for God alone. For God alone, for my expectation is from him. My soul waits for God alone, for God alone. I'm not looking for alternatives. God can use men. God can send help from anybody. But Lord, my heart is waiting on God. I, my dependence is on God. I'm trusting God. My expectation is that God never fails and God will never fail me. He's faithful who has called Hallelujah. We must arrive at a Christian life where God is first. Amen. And, and that's the truth. That's the truth. Praise God. Father, we give you glory this morning. There's still a lot to say. Amen. We must arrive at a Christian life where God is always first. Always. Always. Always first. So let's bow our heads where we are sat. As you think about this message this morning, I want you to, like David, who said, my soul waits silently for God alone. For my expectation is from him. God is the sustainer of the very life you live. That's so my message this morning is to prioritize. To prioritize to prioritize and grace is released this morning the grace into the presence of God which is what we have been trusting God for and also this morning I believe that 
God will be setting free. Yesterday evening, while we were praying, just the Holy Spirit moved on my heart to declare deliverance, deliverance from besetting sins, deliverance from things that have held back our destiny. And today I believe that Jesus, who was revealed as the Lord that healed, is bringing physical healing. When they got to Mara in the book of Exodus, the Bible said the waters were bitter. And so I feel very strongly in my heart this morning that whoever is here in a situation where it looks like you have arrived at, at bitter waters, we are putting in the name of Jesus as the healer. The name of Jesus Christ. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth, he not only heals, he stands in the way. He said, I will not permit the sicknesses that I permitted to go on the Egyptians to come upon you. And so there is a wall of fire round about that the glory that he planted might shine from within you. And so this morning, I want you to begin to receive your healing by faith. In whatever area you feel pain, in whatever situation, I want you to lay your hands upon yourself and begin to declare the name of Jesus as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. The Lord who heals. God desires you. You are God's great desire. God desires you. The Bible says he rejoices over us with dancing. God rejoices over you. Christ went to the cross for you. And so every kind of unease or dis-ease, whatever will hinder your worship of God, God is taken away today. The financial situation, the physical problem, the emotional wound, the disappointment, the things that are hurting inside that you cannot tell anybody, every kind of issue, I want to believe because God said today he wants to bring healing. He wants to bring healing. And so I'm praying into all the dimensions of where there might be unease. There are certain things in your spirit you feel uneasy about. There are decisions you have made and you, are just, you just feel uneasy about it. God will correct you. God will open your eyes to see. There will be discernment in the spirit to know he said, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, go in it. You will not be led astray. And so this communion is a communion of alignment with God. Communion of alignment with God, whereby God will be given the freedom to do what he wants to do in your life. It's a communion of alignment with the will and the purpose of God. He said, as it is in heaven, so let it be on earth. That we align ourselves, we declare our desire is for him as his desire is for us. And so, Lord, thank you. A healing in the stomach, in the gut. There's healing taking place in the gut. There's healing taking place. There's healing taking place in the gut. There's healing taking place in, in, in the gut. 